Well, good morning, everyone. Over the past couple days, there's been a fair share of reporting, some good, some bad, about what is transpiring, transpiring in our great nation and the role of the Department of Defense and its leaders. I want to take a few minutes to address these issues in person to make clear the facts and offer my views. First, let me say up front, the killing of George Floyd by a Minneapolis policeman is a horrible crime. The officers on the scene that day should be held accountable for his murder. It is a tragedy that we have seen repeat itself too many times. With great sympathy, I want to extend the deepest of condolences to the family and friends of George Floyd from me and the department. Racism is real in America, and we must all do our very best to recognize it, to confront it, and to eradicate it. I've always been proud to be a member of an institution, the United States military, that embraces diversity and inclusion and prohibits hate and discrimination in all forms. More often than not, we have led on these issues. And while we still have much to do on this front, leaders across DOD and the services take this responsibility seriously, and we are determined to make a difference. Every member of this department has sworn an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. I've taken this oath many times, beginning at the age of 18 when I entered West Point. The rights that are embedded in this great document begin with the First Amendment, which guarantees the five freedoms of speech, religion, press, assembly, and the right to petition the government. The United States military is sworn to defend these and all other rights, and we encourage Americans at all times to exercise them peacefully. It is these rights and freedoms that make our country so special, and it is these rights and freedoms that American service members are willing to fight and die for. At times, however, the United States military is asked, in support of governors and law enforcement, to help maintain law and order so that other Americans can exercise their rights free from violence against themselves or their property. That is what thousands of guardsmen are doing today in cities across America. It is not something we seek to do, but it is our duty, and we do it with the utmost skill and professionalism. I was rem reminded of that Monday as I visited our National Guardsmen who were on duty Monday night protecting our most hallowed grounds and monuments. I'm very proud of the men and women of the National Guard who are out on the streets today performing this important task, and in many ways, at the risk of their own welfare. I've always believed and continue to believe that the National Guard is best suited for performing domestic support to civ civil authorities in these situations in support of local law enforcement. I say this not only as Secretary of Defense, but also as a former soldier and a former member of the National Guard. The option to use active duty forces in a law enforcement role should only be used as a matter of last resort and only in the most urgent and dire of situations. We are not in one of those situations now. I do not support invoking the Insurrection Act. Last night, a story came out based on a background interview I did earlier in the day. It focused on the events last Monday evening in Lafayette Park, and I found it to be inaccurate in parts. So I, I want to state very clearly for all to hear my account of what happened that Monday afternoon. I did know that following the President's remarks on Monday evening that many of us were going to join President Trump and review the damage in Lafayette Park and at St. John's Episcopal Church. What I was not aware of was exactly where we were going when we, we, when we arrived at the church and what the plans were once we got there. It was also my aim and General Milley's to meet with and thank the members of the National Guard who were on duty that evening in the park. It is something the President likes to do as well. The path we took to and from the church didn't afford us that opportunity, but I was able to spend a considerable amount of time with our guardsmen later that evening as I moved around the city to many of the locations at which they were posted. 
I also want to address a few other matters that have been raised about that evening. First, National Guard forces did not fire rubber bullets or tear gas into the crowd as reported. Second, guardsmen were instructed to wear helmets and personal protective equipment for their own protection, not to serve as some form of intimidation. Third, military leaders, including the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, were wearing field uniforms because that is the appropriate uniform when working in a command center and meeting with troops in the streets. Fourth, it wasn't until yesterday afternoon that we determined it was a National Guard helicopter that hovered low over a city block in D.C. Within an hour or so of learning of this, I directed the Secretary of the Army to conduct an inquiry to determine what happened and why, and a report back to me. Now, y'all have been very generous with your time, so let me wrap up by stating again how very proud I am of our men and women in uniform. The National Guard, over the short span of several months, has gone from tackling natural disasters such as floods to combating the coronavirus across the country to now dealing with civil unrest in support of law enforcement on the streets of America. All while many of their fellow guardsmen are deployed abroad defending against America's real adversaries. Most importantly, I want to assure all of you and all Americans that the Department of Defense, the Armed Services, our uniform leaders, our civilian leaders, and I take seriously our oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States and to safeguard those very rights contained in that, that document we cherish so dearly. This is a tough time for our great country these days, but we will get through it. My hope is that instead of the violence in the streets, we will see peaceful demonstrations that honor George Floyd, that press for accountability for his murder, that move us to reflect about racism in America, and that serve as a call to action for us to come together and to address this problem once and for all. This is the America your military represents. This is the America we aspire to be. And this is the America that we're committed to defending with our lives. Thank you. We'll go to the phones. Bob Burns. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, taking you back to your comments about uh, Monday evening, when you left the White House um, with the president and others, uh, I think if I heard you correctly, you said you did know that you were going to be going to the St. John's Church, but you didn't know what would happen when you got there. And you've since been criticized by many for essentially participating in a presidential photo op. So my question is, uh, do you regret having participated? Well, I, I did know that we were going to the church. I was not aware of a photo op was happening. Of course, the president uh, drags a large uh, press pool along with him. And look, I do everything I can to try to stay apolitical and to try and stay out of situations uh, that may appear political. And uh, sometimes I'm successful at doing that, and, uh, and sometimes I'm not as successful. But my aim is to keep the department out of politics, to stay apolitical. And that's what I continue to try and do, as well as my leaders here in the department. All right. We'll go to uh, uh, Phil Stewart. Yeah, uh, hi, uh, Mr. Secretary. Could you uh, address, there's been a lot of, of criticism of your use of the word battle space to describe uh, areas inside the United States where people are protesting. Uh, could you, would you like to take that uh, phrase back? And uh, when you talk about keeping the military apolitical, um, how do you see uh, you know, the department uh, navigating this when uh, the response to protest has become a partisan issue? Thanks. Well, I'll take your second question first, Phil. That is the challenge, right? It's, uh, it's a, uh, there, there's a political tone to this. We are in a political season, an election approaches, and this is always a challenge for every Department of Defense in every election year. And so this is something we're going to continue to deal with as we creep closer and closer to election season. Uh, I've been speaking about the importance of staying out of politics by remaining apolitical uh, to my leadership since, uh, since I took office. I reinforced it when I came in when we started the, the new year, and I've talked about it several times since then, uh, but this will be the ongoing challenge. With regard to your first question, as, as you rightly said earlier this week, I was quoted as saying the, the best way, way to get street violence under control was by dominating the battle space, and probably all of you who cover the Pentagon hear us use this phrase often. Uh, it's something we use day in and day out. There are other phrases that we use day in, day out that, that you all understand that most people don't understand. Uh, it is part of our military lexicon that I grew up with, 
uh, and it's what we routinely use to describe a bounded area of operations. It's not a phrase focused on people, uh, and certainly not on our fellow Americans, as some have suggested. It is a phrase I used over the weekend when speaking with Minnesota Governor Waltz. Uh, he and I spoke a couple times on Friday and Saturday as I spoke to him about um, uh, DOD support to what was happening there. Uh, keep in mind, it was only a, uh, a few short days ago where uh, Minneapolis was the epicenter and uh, all eyes were focused on, on Minnesota. Uh, but Governor Waltz is also a former member of the National Guard, and I was complimenting him on the call with the governors about what he had done. It was his successful use of the Guard in sufficient numbers that really wrested control of the streets from the looters and others breaking the law. And that's, so I was giving him credit for that. And he was doing so so that peaceful demonstrations could be held, so that peaceful demonstrators could uh, share their frustration and their anger. Uh, that's what I was uh, encouraging other governors to consider. In retrospect, I would use different wording so as not to distract from the more important matters at hand or allow some to suggest that we are militarizing the issue. All right, uh, Louis Martinez. Um, yes, sir. Thank you much for, very, for doing this briefing. Um, some of the people that criticized you for the term of battle space were some of America's most uh, respected former generals. Um, and they said that that was just inappropriate language. And if I could move on to uh, what you knew about the situation at Lafayette Square, um, were you aware that the park police were going to use such strong measures in pushing back the, um, the protesters there? And did you express any concerns that that may not be exactly what needed to happen uh, to make that photo op uh, possible? Uh, thanks for the question, uh, Luis. I, uh, I was not aware of uh, law enforcement's plans for the park. I was not briefed on them, nor should I expect to be. Uh, but uh, they, they had taken what actions I, I assume they felt was uh, necessary, given what they faced. But I was not briefed on the plans and uh, was, was not aware of what they were doing. All right. Um, Dan Lamoff. Uh, yes, Mr. Secretary, thanks for your time. Uh, I realize you're trying to keep the department out of politics, but it took you a week uh, to, to say anything along the lines of what you did at the top of this call uh, and, and your strong, <clears throat> strong comments this morning about George Floyd. Uh, in, in light of the more than 200,000 black service members in uniform and the pain across the country, why did it take so long? Thanks. Thanks, thanks Dan. It's a fair question. I think uh, you may have written about this, and, and as you rightly said, uh, uh, I've worked very hard to keep the department out of politics, which is very hard uh, these days as we move closer and closer to an election. You know, remaining apolitical means that there are times to speak up and times not to. And as I said in my earlier remarks, uh, what happened to George Floyd happens way too often in this country. And most times we don't speak about these matters as a department. Um, but as events have unfolded over the past few days, it became very clear that this is becoming a, a, a very combustible national issue. And uh, what I wanted to do, uh, I had made the determination as events escalate in the last 72 hours that the moment had, had reached a point where it warranted uh, a clear message to the department uh, about, uh, about our approach. And so given the dynamics, I wanted to lead by crafting my own statement for the department first, which I did yesterday. And uh, you all should have seen it and, and got it. It went out, uh, this piece of paper. But my message to the force, uh, which set, I thought is the proper tone uh, for our service members and DOD civilians and all, and giving my leaders the space to also craft similar messages expressing our outrage at what happened, expressing our commitment to the Constitution, expressing our commitment as an institution uh, to, uh, um, to uh, end racism and hatred in all its forms, and just a general expression uh, with regard to what the department is about. So uh, that, that's the timeline, Dan, if you will, and that, that's why it did, and I do that with great counsel from uh, the, my, my advisors. Uh, we'll go uh, one more from the phone. Uh, the, the chiefs, several of the chiefs were interested in speaking up sooner. Uh, sometimes when you say nothing, that says something unto itself. Uh, in, in retrospect, would you have done so more quickly? Well, we did. We, uh, you know, General Milley, we talked to the chiefs. There was uh, most of the chiefs uh, well, wanted to take the lead from me. And, uh, and so what I told them is I was, or through the chairman, I was going to take a, I was going to send the initial message out again to set the tone, to uh, express my views, and then uh, give them the space to, to share their views as well to do so. And uh, again, this is, 
uh, we are a week into this or so. Uh, and, and when you look at what's escalated, it's been a matter of 72 hours, uh, maybe uh, 96 or so. So, uh, and we've been consumed with a lot of things between now and then, but I do think it's important to speak up and to speak out and to share what we view, again, as an institution, uh, the, the racism that exists in America and how we view it as an institution. Again, I, I think we've led on these issues uh, over the history of the United States military and will continue to do so, uh, certainly while I'm at the helm. All right, one more from the phone, Tom Bowman. <laughs> If uh, not Tom, then uh, Nick Schifrin. Mr. Secretary, thanks very much for doing this. Uh, if I could take you back to um, uh, the other night, uh, I, I know you're saying that you didn't know exactly what the plans were, uh, but with all due respect, those plans were designed uh, by the Commander-in-Chief and also by Bill Barr, of course, a fellow secret uh, Cabinet Secretary and someone who is in the command center with you. Uh, so how could you not know about those plans and, and what does it say about those plans to both clear uh, the park and go to the church and do what the president did? Uh, and number two, I know you're conducting an inquiry on the use of the helicopter. You may not want to say this, but do you believe it was inappropriate to use a medevac helicopter to intimidate protesters? Thank you. On the first thing, Nick, again, I think there's some speculation with regard to what you, what you stated. I'd encourage you to speak to the Department of Justice as, again, it was a law enforcement action. I had not yet arrived at the command post. Uh, I was en route to the command post when I was asked to return to the White House to update the president. Uh, I got back to the White House, and uh, within a short period of time, uh, we were, the president went out to give his remarks. So there was no space in between there. Uh, there was no opportunity to get a briefing. And again, nor would I expect to get a briefing on what uh, the law enforcement community was planning to do with regard to the clearing of park. Again, that was not a military decision. It was not a military action. Uh, the National Guard was there in support of the, uh, in support of law enforcement. With regard to your second question, uh, I would just say this much, I'm not going to comment because I've asked that an inquiry be made. I want to make sure I understand why, uh, what happened, who was involved, uh, what orders were they given or not given, uh, was, was there a, a, a safety issue involved, right, with an aircraft uh, hovering that low. So there's a lot of questions that need to be answered. I spoke to Secretary McCarthy last night about it. He is digging into it, and we will get the facts, and we'll go back from there. All right. In the room, Tara. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. So you served in the D.C. National Guard. And I did. That's to right. follow on Nick's question, were you surprised that a medical helicopter from the D.C. National Guard was used to intimidate people who were peacefully assembling? And then secondly, as this goes on, you've asked the Secretary of the Army to look into this, um, who tasked the helicopter. Right. Was the helicopter under the authority of the Department of Justice? Is that why there's this kind of murkiness about how the helicopter was tasked, how a medical helicopter was used in an aggressive form? Yeah, so those are some of the details we have to tease out in terms of, you know, who directed it, what was request, was it at the request of law enforcement. Uh, you made a statement that it was to intimidate protesters. I got a report back that they were asked by law enforcement to, to, uh, to, to look at uh, a checkpoint, a National Guard checkpoint, to see if there were protesters around. So there's conflicting reports. I don't want to add to that. I think we need to let the Army conduct its inquiry and then get back and see what the facts actually are. But when you looked at the video, if you didn't see it well, live... I, I, look, uh, I, I think uh, when you're landing that low in the city, it's, it's, it looks unsafe to me, right? But I need to find out, I need to learn more about what's going on. Uh, you, it would not be unsafe if they were a medevac bird picking up somebody who was seriously injured or something like that, right? It would be a different circumstance. So we have to find out all the facts, take it all in, and let the Army do its work, and then come back with, uh, with what they discovered. But to your Let's, understanding, it was not a medevac mission. I, that's right. To my understanding, it wasn't. I need to uh, – I'm sorry, but I need to uh, actually head to the White House. So I just want to wrap up by saying uh, something to the, directly to the men and women of the Department of Defense. And let me say this. Uh, as I said in my message to the Department yesterday, I appreciate your professionalism and dedication to defending the Constitution for all Americans. Moreover, I'm amazed by the countless remarkable accomplishments of the Department of Defense in today's trying times, from repatriating and sheltering Americans who were evacuated from a foreign land, to delivering food and medical supplies to communities in need, and to protecting our cities and communities. In every challenge and across every mission, the U.S. military has remained ready, capable, and willing to serve. As I reminded you in February, I ask that you remember at all times our commitment as a department and as public servants to stay apolitical in these turbulent days. 
For well over two centuries, the United States military has earned the respect of the American people by being there to protect and serve all Americans. Through your steadfast dedication to the mission and our core values, and your enduring support to your fellow Americans, we will safeguard the hard-earned trust and confidence of the public as our nation's most respected institution. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, can you